Um, okay, so last section. Um, thanks for uh, tuning in. I'm Andy Warfield. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Coho Data. And this is the last section of my storage field day eight presentations. And this is about the work that we've done. And I think this is fairly unique as a, as a sort of storage company to actually provide facilities in the storage system to move compute, extensible compute using Docker um, into the storage system. And so I'm just gonna talk through some of, some of what we've done here. Now, I've been starting all of the uh, sections with a really high level sort of overview of what I'm characterizing. So we allow the storage system with our next release to be extended with container environments. Uh, these environments are isolated from a resource perspective uh, from the storage system itself, but they allow compute to be pushed in and to run directly on top of the data that it's accessing. And that this turns out to be a pretty interesting model for, uh, for, for a lot of customer applications. Um, and so I would argue that the thing we're challenging here is the idea that storage systems present protocols. Right, that, that you, know, you measure the capability of a storage system is what protocols it provides and then how it implements the data underneath that. We do all of those things, but what we're really doing with this is moving that line down a little bit and allowing the storage system to absorb compute that works directly with the data. Right? That might actually be to allow you to present a new protocol. Right? So for example, you could stick in a S3 implementation right, that ran directly on the system and presented S3 as a new protocol. Right? And some of our use of containers inside the system is actually internally around segmenting out our implementation and allowing us to have sort of you know, clean modular divisions of how we, how we build the storage itself. Um, so examples of this are you know, in one of the big use cases that we did this year, to be able to just stand up an analytics cluster, right? stand up a Spark cluster and start performing analysis on data that's stored. Right? It's a really valuable and near-term benefit. A uh, second example is uh, partnering with third-party appliances to allow you to stand up instances of appliances using containers right, that beneficially would also be served by your enterprise infrastructure. So one example of that that we work with a customer on right now is the ability to stand up Elasticsearch. Right? That, you know, they were using a VMware environment where the main sort of thing that ran in VMware was a bunch of Elasticsearch instances. We migrated those to run inside the storage and now they have storage that presents Elasticsearch and NFS and then a small VM footprint outside that, that works against both of those APIs. Enrico. So a lot of CPU involved. Do you plan also to release a compute node? For we're, we're, we're still uh, trying to figure that out. Um, it's going to depend entirely on how the, the, the sort of consumers of this go. Um, I don't... I don't currently anticipate this being like a full like container orchestration layer for containers as they're used in a lot of other environments. Single application this is much more of a storage facing sort of container thing. It's IO intensive sort of stuff. You, um, you mentioned uh, that it's um, isolated from a resource perspective yes. as well. Can you explain a bit about that? Yes, so the, con uh, the containers run on dedicated cores that the storage system doesn't use. They have uh, a physically dedicated subset of memory that the storage system you know, doesn't use that they can't steal from the storage system. Uh, they're limited on the network side to isolated v uh, VLANs or VXLANs. Um, so they have very clearly defined interfaces into the storage. but we're very neurotic about screwing up the bread and butter bit of selling storage, and so we've, we've put these things into a very constrained environment. We've erred on the side of caution spectacularly with the first release of containers in the, in the system. But many, many of the applications you mentioned are very memory intensive. Yes, yes. So in some situations where we've been working with customers on these, we've boosted the memory inside the nodes to be able to, to do that. Uh, it's just a matter of adding a few more dims to the, to the package. Um, and then in the limit, this is really around allowing people to develop and push code, right, to run next to the data, right? Simple examples of this, if you combine it with some of the analytics stuff, is being able to build a dashboard, right, that sits on top of your log data and gives you log results, right, just directly inside the system. Um, and so let me, let me quickly get through this. Do you guys benefit from a what is a container sort of characterization, or is that silly to this audience. Right? I think most right. of us get it. Everybody gets it, right? So, you know, threads process virtual machines. Maybe we went a little bit too far with the virtual machine thing, so here we go, right? It's in the middle. Um, 
they typically talk about microservices, right? Is just just this is just making sure that we're clear on terminology more than anything else, right? That the people who really advocate strongly for microservices have very similar ways of describing what they're building as what we describe when we're talking about the way that we built NFS, right? That you know you build this shared nothing thing, and as you come under load, you add more of those things and you balance traffic across them, right? In particular, Kubernetes is an orchestration layer for microservices has an explicit abstraction for a load balancer that sits on the front of it. And it looks a lot like the way we use the SDN switch, right? And so that's an interesting sort of overlap between those two things. So let me, I want to talk mostly about the, uh, the work that we did with Intel and UBS. Um, so the approach cost for doing big data, right, for doing analytics on data, this is a very, very, despite all of the excitement about it, like young area of computing. And we talked to a ton of people that were, you know, dealing with big data environments in their, in their IT shops and in their organizations. And one thing that you see is big frequently isn't that big, right? It's, it's terabytes instead of petabytes often. Um, it's often what, what we sort of colloquially call the broom closet IT, right? In that, you know, people are actually buying sets of servers and setting them up in broom closets and, and running environments on them. But it, at the end of the day, if you look about what's involved in getting to writing Spark jobs on these things for like a real use case, you have to do a bunch of stuff. You have to go decide whose distribution you're going to run with. You buy a bunch of hardware, right? Even in the VM uh, case, you have to figure out a bunch of stuff around access to access to storage, especially if you want it to be scalable. And you, the IT side has to understand things like tuning HDFS and how they're going to provision the intermediate storage. And then you have to figure out how to get your data off of your other storage onto this to do analysis, right? All of this stuff is friction that stands in the way of of being able to to run these environments. The other thing that we see is where uh, the big data sort of project is taken on centrally. It ends up being this big mammoth cluster, right? It's like, you know, let's go buy uh, 40 or 80 nodes and install Hortonworks or Cloudera on it, and then people will start to use that. And that works if it's completely greenfield, but what we see in a lot of organizations are teams have already chosen their tools, right? And they're already trusting that they have admin access onto the boxes because they want to go and install their own libraries and there's a distro that they're comfortable with, and they, you know, they want really hands-on customization of the tools. And so virtualizing these clusters allows a sort of multi-tenancy where people can quickly move to use the big data distribution they want and the tools that they want, which is important because the tools are still changing really fast. And so how do we get directly to the writing code part? And so this is what we did, basically, right? We, you know, this is the diagram that I've shown previous years, right? This is our sort of roadmap against supporting protocols. So we still have this focus around NFS, right? These are, these are emerging still. <coughs> we implemented HDFS as a protocol in the system, right? So we implemented the, the data node and name node APIs for HDFS alongside the NFS implementation. So you can speak HDFS into the NFS namespace, and you can run these containers as microservices in the environment, right? So they're hosted. Um, so, I'll just speak really quickly to that, that use case that we did with, with UBS and Intel. It's 23 nodes, uh, 40 gig networking, all flash, two tiers of flash. Um, we worked with uh, Cloudera CDH5 as a, as a sort of testing environment. And at the command line, you can stand up arbitrarily many arbitrary node clusters and work directly against the data. Uh, we integrated with uh, Open vSwitch style switching on each node to allow them to be isolated on their own VXLANs. And so the customers actually receive a completely L2 isolated network for their containers to run on and run these jobs, right? So you put your data into NFS and you decide you want to do a bunch of log analysis on it. It is a single command to stand up a cluster that, that gives you a you know, notebook to work with against the data. Um, okay. Now I'm going to tell you about some of the implementation bits. Does that, does that make sense, right, the, the big data bit of that? So, I mean, if, if you're kind of satisfied with the use case, I'll tell you about some of the cool bits that were involved in building it. Um, the way that people talk about containers, most places that I hear them talk about, and there's like a ton of excitement about them, which is great, um, but most of the consumers are building backends for web-based or phone apps, right? And those things tend to be a bunch of app logic with very little persistent state, that just need to scale out massively, right? The use of containers in a storage system is kind of the opposite of that, right? The use of them is, is to bring compute close to data. And so you really care about the data API, right? And being able to schedule the work to run next to the data that it's working on. And so for that reason, I would emphasize that 
working with Docker or working with containers, it's really just a tool, right? It's something that makes the rest of this easier. But there's a ton of surrounding infrastructure that you can add that really brings value in an enterprise environment. And so in the work that we've done to incorporate these sort of what I've been calling data microservices, the container bit is right here, right? It's just this little piece in the middle. We've built bindings so that the containers have access to notifications of changes in the file system, right? So that you can fire them up in response to data arriving. We've built the ability for the containers to look into the system in case they want to do log analysis. Um, we've built uh, basically capabilities for containers to bind to the network and present services right on top, of, on top of things. So this is really an extensibility interface for the storage system. Um, if I show you a really quick example of what I mean by this. Okay, so this is a Windows VM. It's got a mount on a Coho box over here. What I've got over here is the Coho UI. And this is this prototype sort of uh, container interface where we've implemented some of the APIs from Amazon's AWS Lambda. And so what you can do in here is you can add a rule that matches events in a subset of the file system and launches code inside a container. And so in one example, we've packaged ImageMagick, which is a Linux image transform tool, into a container. And then we've allowed you to write some scripting code to hook it onto the file system. Right? So this is like a really dumb example. It just kind of shows you the potential of what's here. So what this does is it says, convert the thing to grayscale. Right? And so what you get is this special directory on the storage system where if I take this big image here, it's a picture of Whistler in BC, where I live in a bunch not of the development place. team does. It's not a bad place. <laughs> and I drag this and I drop it over here. Right? And so what you see, oh, whoops, oh no. What you see here is it does this very slow copy of this very high resolution image. I think this, uh, this VMware thing is. Look, it's 10 megabit per second ether. Wow, it's super fast. <laughs> this is my image in QMU or something. You mentioned you're using the AWS APIs. Have you implemented like the vast majority of them, or is it a specific subset? We've implemented the uh, JavaScript Lambda APIs, um, but for NFS, right? So we kind of tweaked them, assuming that you had NFS as a target. And so the file copies in here, and immediately, right, the rule says generate the grayscale version, right? And so it just spawns the the thing off there. Um, and so now when you open it, right, there's the grayscale version, right? So it's just offloaded compute. If I go back here. And I adjust this code to say I want it to be 10% resize. Oh, there we go. And I delete this stuff. And copy this in again. Right? It's scaled down. And so the, I'm not interacting with the container at all, right? I've, I've built a bunch of like scaffolding around it that lets me do kind of interesting stuff. So this is one where when we're working with media and entertainment customers, they actually have pretty sophisticated pipelines that surround data arriving and then being moved, encoding, and encoded, stuff like that. exactly. So the, the other examples that I have in there are actually live transcoding examples, whoops, right. right? Where we're moving from 4K to um, 1K or something like to that. 720p <coughs> and 1080, right? Oops. So the microservice that's running, is this running within a container or? Yes. yes. Exactly. In the storage system. Yeah. This yeah. will be part of any enterprise workflow then. Yeah, exactly. You know, something so useful. That's, that's right. Not just converting to right. grayscale. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's, that's kind of how that goes. I, I'm going to try and breeze through the rest of this really quickly. So the, the, the so bits, yeah, go ahead. You're, you're basically, could possibly be the first storage system with crypto wall prevention exactly built in. exactly right? right so all of the things right, the the thing that's that's troubled me a little bit about some of the sort of like data aware things are i don't want to prescribe the data awareness right i want to give you the tools right and third parties the tools to build those things and so if you want a hook on the access path that allows you to search for a social security number great right you define it right every time i've talked to a customer with those kinds of requirements it's different than the other customers that i talk to with those types of requirements and so you know this is a step toward putting in those types of configurability in the system, right? Secure audit logs, right? Transcoding, right? All of these types of, of transforms. So w we don't have a not invented here problem. And in fact, we try not to invent things wherever possible. Um, and so the way that you 
you describe and push containers into the system, we implemented Google's Kubernetes API. Uh, Google has a sort of cloud platform with a way of describing container-based services, and so we use the exact same file format uh, that they use for config and map their services onto the, onto the switching that we do. Um, the microservices are isolated. In the first product release, they're isolated onto uh, isolated uh, VLAN and uh, L3 subnet. Uh, in the POC that we describe with, uh, with UBS and Intel, they're isolated on a VXLAN. Um, we are working on, um, basically, I told you that the containers are rigorously isolated from the rest of the system. Um, the secondary challenge from a scheduling perspective is I want to as densely use the isolated resources as I can. And so we've been working with, uh, uh, with this firmament scheduler um, which actually is de derived from some, some work that was done historically at Google around scheduling um, to pack those things in really specifically. And uh, this is what it looks like. So in the initial release, right, there's the sort of data stream environment, right, the cluster of storage. You use a REST API call to create a tenant environment. The tenant environment has two sort of containerized services in it a priori. It has a Docker registry and it has a syslog target. Right, that unifies logs from all of your other container instances. And then from there, you push your images right into the registry, and then you stand them up. And that's how you start to roll out stuff. Another tenant can come in, and so in there, you can stand up a Spark cluster, or you can stand up your transcode index and encrypt jobs inside there as well. Right? And so that's kind of how things, uh, how things materialize. Um, there are a bunch of APIs in here, um, probably more than we want to get into uh, uh, right now. Um, and it's, it's the first round of things. Um, these are the two papers that I mentioned that we published around the, uh, the work with, uh, with Intel and UBS. Uh, this is a sort of four-page high-level problem statement around converging big data and storage. And this one is a gory, the original version of this was like 16 pages long of 10 point. It's kind of like come down a little bit, but it describes a lot of the technical details of what we built. So if you're interested in a pretty gory read, uh, that's there. Both of these are at this URL on the Coho website. Um, so there's my quick summary of this section. Um, you know, Docker is a tool, um, but it's a pretty fantastic tool in terms of shipping software. And it's one that seems to be getting a lot of adoption. And so it's a good fit for storage. Uh, it's not simply a matter of adopting some arbitrary orchestration framework to make it work well with data. In fact, under Docker, there's been relatively little work to efficiently expose data access into containerized apps. It's weirdly very similar to what happened with VMs at the beginning, where the sort of state of the art is a volume attach. Um, it turned out to be relatively easy to in integrate the stuff into what we do at Coho because we already kind of approached the rest of the storage system this way. Um, and so we're really kind of looking forward to, to new third-party tools that we're able to partner and, and roll in in this way. Um, and we've got some pretty interesting sort of customer interactions happening already. And so I think that we'll have some cool stuff being announced about that over the, over the year between now and when I talk to you guys next. Um, so that's, uh, that's it, I think. Thanks very much for coming, and uh, I'm happy if there are any questions. We've got about, I don't know, five minutes left before, uh, yeah. before we wrap up. Can yeah. you talk about prefetching? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I could yeah. totally talk about prefetching. If you, is, 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 is there five minutes? Do, do you want to talk about anything else, or, or do you want the crazy prefetching thing? Yes, please. Okay. Is it like hyperlog crazy? log analysis? It's yep. the hyperlog log prefetching thing. So, uh, okay, so this is, this is back to session three in terms of the, the prefetching idea. Um, uh, there's, so uh, I feel like we've talked about variants of this observation in, in other storage field day examples. The, the, the core thing is that there are periodic behaviors in storage workloads that are outside of where you would usually make caching decisions, right? You usually make caching decisions in like seconds or minutes. But when a defrag job happens in the middle of the night, it screws up all the VDI users that come in in the morning, right? Because they're supposed to turn off defrag, but they don't. Right? Um, or when end of month runs right on the 30th or 31st, right, it pushes a whole bunch of other stuff out of Flash. And so what can you do to spot these things? And so like I said, the hyperlog logs allow you to look over broad periods of time, the counter stacks, and, and ask questions. And so the work that we're, we're sort of exploring on this, and this is relatively early, but it's a really cool application of the counter stacks. And in the, in the research paper we wrote on it, we had some early results on this, are that if this is Monday, right, and this is Tuesday, and this is Wednesday, through the day, and you see the burst of people coming in in the morning, and then right, it kind of does this, and then there's lunch, and then it dies off in the evening, and then there's some nightly job that, that does stuff, right? And the days all look kind of similar. 
And so how do you use some compute right, to make better decisions here? Because a lot of the previous sort of like tricks that people did to do sort of hierarchical storage on this kind of thing involved looking at hotness over periods of time, like building a heat map on the day, sorting by hotness, and then just for the next day going, these are the things that need to come into memory. Right? There are these types of strategies. There are two things that are neat to observe. One is that there's this repeated, let's say, nightly event that's whacking stuff, and the other one is that you don't actually care about its performance. Right? It's, you, know, you could optimize this, but it's this that's the thing that is going to get damaged. And so the thing that we can do with the hyperlog logs is we can do a sort of periodicity analysis on storage. Right? We can look for repeated times where there is bursts of load. Right? And so that analysis says, well, there's something that kind of happens every morning. Right? There's some other stuff. And then there's something that pretty clearly happens right, every night. And so with the uniqueness comparison inside the counter stacks, what I can do is I can look at these spans of time. And in the same way that I deduced about data being unique across regions, I can make the same deduction about whether these are likely to contain very similar data. Right? And so it's not a solution to the prefetching problem, but it's a deduction that allows you to look for the times in workload that you should go focus on. So what you do here is you add basically two API calls to the system. One is a call to dump the metadata about what blocks are currently held in your fast storage. Right? You dump the LRU. Right? And so I take a snapshot of that around here, and around here, and around here. Right? And then I take another one around there, and around there, and around there. Right? I just write them to disk. And I backhaul these ones over on stream. And if they're the same, right, it means that the working sets that have come in here have been basically the same in all of these examples, right? that it's a repeated disruptive workload. And so I ignore them. Right? I'm actually not going to do anything with those. What I do instead is I grab these ones. And I push a prefetch rule <laughs> yeah, yeah. to that. Try to warm up the cache <laughs> after the after the abusive workload. Yeah. yeah. Right, and I'm basically done. Right, and so now this data, which is probably totally different across yeah. these things, yeah. because it's whatever was left in there over Before the course the of the day. the backup fired up. Yeah. Right, I can I can basically insulate the contents of fast memory against this disruptive workload. Like there are other versions of this. There are other applications that are tidier, but this is a really easy one to understand. And so you know, and you can you can do the same thing at, at month end and stuff like that. And so this, again, is, is relatively early stuff. Right? My, my hope is that the next time we talk about this, I'll have like a really, really super great illustration. It's, I, you know, I, I went back and I looked at the storage field day presentations. I find it heartening. Because right? when I start to do this, you to put it, it together, I feel like, oh, what has happened in the last year? It's miserable. Like, I don't have anything to tell these guys about. But then I like, start to go through, and I'm like, actually, we made Lots some progress. Change, right? Right? There's, there's some stuff that's happened. So, Anyway, I think that's probably a good, uh, a good place to end. I'll thank you all very much for, for coming. And if you have questions, especially you know, as you reflect on this or you're writing stuff up, I'm always happy to talk about it. So just let me know. I'd be, I'd be more than happy to, to give you tons more detail <laughs> or, or summaries that are less cryptic, if that's useful as well. <laughs>